of us at the Dub Network and Harps Court would like to thank the crew at Herman Marshall Whiskey for being such a tremendous partner. Herman Marshall is known for their handcrafted, award-winning small batch whiskey. Whether it is their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all of their whiskeys are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Hey, welcome back to Harps Court. I'm your host, Derek Harper. My co-host is with me this afternoon, Mark Aguirre. Welcome. And we have a special guest, two special guests, in fact. Uh, one is the great John Sally um, that's made fun of me since we've been in the NBA, but it's, <laughs> it's all good, Sal. And we have another special guest, and she is Joy Effects. So thanks, thank all of you guys for joining me. Say, I want to start with you. What is going on? Yeah. It's been forever. I hadn't talked to you. I hadn't seen you. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to tell everybody the last time I played <laughs> against uh, Derek Harper, I was on uh, the Chicago Bulls. And, um, you know, Hop is a great defensive player. They, they don't talk about you enough. Michael Jordan was like, yo, man, it's, I'm tired. Hop is all over me. Right. And I said, let's run a high pick and roll. And... This was in New Go, York, by the way. This is in New York. Go yes. to your right. And, you know, I learned how to set picks uh, in Detroit. And Mike went one way and Hop thought he was cutting them off. And I sat there with my arms up. Yeah. And, and Hop crumbled. I did. And, and he looked at me like it was uh See, I've been looking for you of, since. I haven't seen you. I've been looking the, for you. <laughs> the Game of Thrones. I thought one of those dragons, his nose opened up. I said, oh. <laughs> I just said a pick. <laughs> That's all I did. That is funny. Uh, so just, just want to get into it a little bit. I got two bad boys on, on, the, on the air with me right now. So what, what do you see the difference? I've asked Mark this question, too. What do you see the difference of now and then when it comes to a, to the game, both offensively and defensively? Um, what, what's changed in the game is they realize that um, the players were NASCAR slash Formula One cars. Mm, and like they that. started taking care of the cars better. Um, they, it wasn't just uh, old-style wrestling. It, mm. it became WWE. And the difference with defense is because of the rules, you're not allowed to put your hands on people. That's right. You have to, because the NBA needed more scoring. And, we, and as bad boys, our, our love was to shut you down. Yes. The 85 points. And then let Mark Aguirre and James Edwards uh, shoot you to death. Right. And <laughs> and, 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 and in offense, they literally changed and went and has gone to analytics. So the more shots you put toward the basket, the better chances you have of winning the game. The difference is schemes. Um, it seems like all of their plays are based about the top of the key, mm -hmm. as opposed to throw the ball down to the, on the block guy and make cuts and then let the big man let it be a big man's game. Yeah, I think it's it's become a game of let's see how many shots we can make with the least amount of percentage. You, and, and that and that proved it. So, do you enjoy it still, though? I mean, it's changed. Everything changes, right? Do well, you, I, I never, you still I never enjoy enjoyed it? watching. I never enjoyed watching right. uh, other people play the game. Okay. Um, I, I was all when I was growing up. You know, Dr. J was the man. Moses Malone. It was those years before I was going to college, mm -hmm. and like 1989, 19, 19, 19, 1979, ooh, it sounds so funny, in the 1900s, and uh, 1980. <laughs> when the game would get to the third quarter, I would go outside, and I'd be in the park. Right. And by the time everybody else got out, I'd been out there for an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. And they would come out acting like they were Dr. J. And my job was totally trying <laughs> to be John Sally. And, <laughs> and uh, I know how to play a game within a game within a game. And I knew how to, uh, if you threw my guy the ball, he had three seconds to make a decision. Mm. Nowadays, if a guy takes a shot, a big man goes and he shoots a three-pointer and it hits the rim, they go, good shot. Right. If if anybody other than Bill Lambeer, Sam Perkins, yes. would take a three pointer, 
we would look at him like seven foot get your butt <laughs> yeah, by the what you doing basket. what are you doing <laughs> yeah it was it was an entirely different um different feel and different move and so i just think now the game is what they would call more exciting more people um i think they're they're talented i think they're way talented i think they're faster they jump higher shoot it better maybe I think their sneakers are better. I think they got private jets and massage <laughs> therapists. Tell them so. Yeah, like <laughs> the part. things that they have. It always, to, always yeah. hurts, so. <laughs> When Chuck Daly used to threaten me if I didn't get my stuff together, he was going to trade me to Milwaukee because he knew I didn't like being in Milwaukee. Right. But imagine we used to stay at a hotel across the street from the Mecca and walk across the street. At the height. It was snow, yeah. rain. Yes, sir. You know, it, it was a different thing now. These guys have to have security. So they became <laughs> movie stars in, in, in sports. And it's amazing what it turned out to be. Uh, I'm proud of what it turned out to be. I'm a huge LeBron fan. Um, I'm a huge Kyrie fan. Let's get into that. Uh, I love what LeBron has done. He, he just, I think he, he made the game better to me. So you, you bad boys. What, what, yes. I know what Mark's definition is of it. Why don't you guys collaborate together <laughs> and and talk, tell the people what those bad boys mean? Because I wasn't scared of none of y'all, but go ahead. Right, you you were, <laughs> but your teammates were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it was like I always say, uh, as they said, we're going to come in, drink up all your drink, smoke up all your smoke, and beat you. <laughs> so I, I would I would get into that. Uh, mentality that we knew that everybody was marking us off on their schedule mm -hmm. of a game you better be well rested for. Right, right. So we had this idea of it was us against the world. Mm -hmm. And it was a trip when Mark came into Detroit. I remember that day, like, you know, I cried when AD got uh, traded, but yeah, then yeah. Mark came on the bus carrying his bag, what's up, what's up, what's up, sat down, then had to sit in AD seat. And I was a fan of Mark McGuire. He didn't say anything. What was you talking about? You're right, right. Well, you remember, uh, uh, AD was my teacher, but then all of a sudden, Mark was there. And check this out. d Hawk. <laughs> yes, sir. They put me on injured reserve that night. <laughs> For the and, told, and told, he said, your ankle still hurt, right? Yeah. <laughs> Take because, Mark, because Mark came over. He, he came over in the Mark came over. He, yeah. needs, he needs the ball in his hand. He needs to Absolutely. learn the system. He needs to get into it. And the difference with us, is we were about winning. Mm -hmm. Now, why I say that is I didn't feel threatened by anybody. Right. If anybody was going to help us win, that's all we needed. And Mark fit like a glove, mm -hmm. like a glove. To the point where I got married um, three years later, four years later, and I asked Mark to be at my wedding. Right. None of those other fools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are. Yes, man. Everybody thinks that they are a championship team. Mm hmm my eyes were open to the fact of it's just more than having the best score and the best this and the best that. To be a unit is not easy. And being a unit means that, and everybody say this, I'll give more to the team than myself, all that crap. <laughs> when you actually say the team means more to me than my individual goals, most people are lying. They totally lying. But I went to a basketball team where they traded their best score and probably one of the most popular players on their team and committed to from day one, but I had to commit to them. Mm. Not by saying it. I had to show it. And by showing it, you can get no team tighter than that because whatever Sal told me, I believed in it, and I did. Mark, you ain't guarding nobody. <laughs> Mark, don't let him, please don't let him come down the middle no more. <laughs> you need to sit your ass on the bench. <laughs> but I had to take that. I had to take that lesson and that learning in order to get the total confidence of the entire team that nobody's bigger than the team. And I don't think very many teams – that you can tell that are able to actually honestly make that commitment. I don't know if it might be two teams in the NBA now, maybe three. Everybody else just playing a the game. They just playing a the game. 
You know, that, yeah. that's interesting because it sounds like you guys policed each other, which, I, yeah. in my opinion, I think it makes a coach's job extremely easy when you think about the kind of personalities that you guys had on your team. So would you say that you guys had multiple leaders or was, was Isaiah the leader? Was Joe? Well, I know Joe wasn't. He doesn't talk. Does Joe talk now, by the way? Not to us. <laughs> to a lot Not of to <laughs> he didn't do a lot of well, talking. This, this, I, I don't think we had a lot of leaders. Right. We took we took our orders well. Yes, yes. Right. Okay. So like we knew Isaiah was a leader. He had the ball eighty percent of the time right. he had, between he and Joe. Yeah. We knew when Vinny came in the game, Shots. the first play mm -hmm. was yeah. going to Vinny. There you go. Go to we we the reason I would tell Mark, I said, Mark, I can block anybody's shot. You don't have to foul them, just <laughs> make them go to the outside of the basket. They go to the outside of the basket, I'm gonna come over your back. Just stay in between them and the basket. And I'm gonna try to block the shot. And if they know I'm coming, they're gonna think of how to fade. And then Mark would punish them. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, <laughs> we, I've never seen anybody with the size of hands and his ability to play. Like, I admired him watching him in college. Yeah. I was afraid to guard him when I was in the pro. We, so we all felt like happy. this. Huh? <laughs> I was so happy Mark Aguirre was our teammate <laughs> that it was, it was a whole, and let me tell you, Mark would get on the floor, Mark would play defense. Mm -hmm. if, if, if he got beat, he would yell help, not put us in a position of fouling and being with mm -hmm. him. But he didn't, he, he was in it, man. Mark was like, he became a scrapper like we did because we knew the year before, I remember when we lost in 88 or uh, was cheated. Um, by the NBA. Um, <laughs> that, uh, Get it I'm all sorry. out, Snell. Get it all <laughs> out. I didn't mean to tell the truth, but when we were cheated <laughs> by the NBA, I, I think we took two weeks off. Right. Maybe. So we were all back to working in the middle of July. Mm -hmm. And Isaiah said, if we get home court advantage, they can't beat us. And so our main objective, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I like, you know, party and, and, and hanging out. But when it came time to play, I was never tired. That's right. I was, I was always ready to destroy you or talk smack to you mm -hmm. or get in your head. Mm -hmm. We just followed on. Chuck Daly said to me, he said, I know you scored in college, and I know you think you can you know, do that here. He said, I need block shots and rebounds. You block shots, rebound, and play defense, you'll play a lot of minutes. And it took that. A lot of people, you ain't even a starter. But when I look back, I realize I never started a game, but I damn sure finished a lot of them. <laughs> which, is, was, which is ultimately what, that, that's ultimately what we want to do anyway. You want to finish the game? You want to <laughs> be right. on the court with sweat on you. Yes, sir. That's, that's, what, that's where I was yeah. when we were playing. You know, you talked about Chuck you know, and your, your coaching staff, Sal. Smith, I'm, right. I'm going to ask you, Smith, what was the difference? You left Dallas. You joined the bad boys. What did you find coaching, the difference in the coaching when you got to Detroit? Because Chuck Daly, obviously the late Chuck Daly, Hall of Fame coach, um, one of the best dressed men I've ever seen, uh, perfect hair. But what was Chuck like in the locker room and on the court? Well, you got to understand the position that the, that the team was in. Mm-hmm. Team had went to the seventh game of the NBA Finals. So all the things that it took in order to get to the NBA Finals, they've been through the last three or four years. So what Chuck was able to become is more of a, a kind of a, a manager of the entire game. So, you know, he didn't have to tell us, you move here, you move there, you do this. We knew all of that. Mm -hmm. That he had to say, look, if I can't get this out of you, I have to sit you down or yeah. you have to do that. He would tell you, if I can't get this, Mark, you're not guarding nobody, you got to sit your ass down because we can't afford to give up points like that. So he managed us like perfectly, but you had all the guys that were on the team that trusted Chuck's management. Like, if you say that, man, all right, but damn, don't forget about me down here. I got them. I want to go back in the game. <laughs> Chuck, like, get back in the game. I'm serious. Yeah. So, Everybody accepted the way he, you know, you say coach. He had coached us earlier, but when it came to game time, he, you know how we play, and you're mm -hmm. not. So you need to sit your ass down. Who going to do it? I need that. You know, right. if you can't do it, you sit your ass down. And 
we play the piston way, I would guess, Sal, and say, like, we played like Detroit Pistons. We we yeah. was known for the way we played, and that's how we played every game. We played like Detroit Pistons. I looked at it this way, Hawk. Chuck Daly, uh, the guys now, he knew how to manage 12 Fortune 500 teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 companies. Uh, everybody, you know, we literally believe, and, I, and I'm going to say this, and I mean this in the right way. We believed we were a family. We believed we were a team. We didn't think about being traded. Mm. We believed in the colors we were wearing, right? Mm. And and that way you're not living in fear going, man, I got to get, you know, my incentive say I got to get this. <laughs> uh, the incentive yes, is sir. win a championship and everybody's yes. going to want you. And and <clears throat> win a championship and that's what we're here to do. We're not here just to, uh, we're here to disrupt what the NBA's plan was. You know, their plan was uh, in 1979, they had Magic and and uh, Larry Bird come to the NBA. Larry Bird knew he was going to be a Celtic. Magic knew he was going to be a Laker. The NBA has a plan on where this is going. And then mm-hmm. the Messiah was born and they put him in Chicago. Right. You remember this? <laughs> Let me just tell, I tell a lot of folks this. That they don't School them, Sal. School them, baby. <laughs> on Chicago had um, uh, Quentin Daly. And Reggie Theus. And Reggie Theus was giving people numbers. Big time. They sat him on, and, and Kevin Lockery was told to sit him. Mm-hmm. Now, this was their leading scorer the year before. Sit him. And then they sent him to exile. They sent him to Kansas City, which became the Sacramento Kings. Yes. <laughs> they, they had a plan. But bless their heart. <laughs> right. Our plan, our plan was to disrupt that plan. Right? We, we knew... It, they wanted, I guess they wanted the Harlem Globetrotters and all of us to be like the Washington Generals. We wasn't going for that. Like, MJ is my frat brother, my boy since since 1982. And then one time, you know, after we beat him, in Chicago, beat him, I'm going up to him and say, man, I can't hang out with you. You one of them. That's said, right. I've always been one of them. <laughs> That's right. Facts. Facts. But the game is over. And uh, where are we going? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, let's get it in. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I did my job, but that's what the deal was. It was to the point where Michael never forgot that I said that. Mm-hmm. And then when, when it became time, to, when Dennis was on the team and James was on the team and then he had to make a decision on me, it wasn't even a thought because he knew whatever colors I'm wearing, I'm on that team. Mm-hmm. I'm not thinking about the other team. right? I, I know what it tastes like to lose. It is not a good taste. It is Man, the nastiest taste in the world. Yeah, agreed. Listen, Sal, Mark. Yeah. I say Dennis Rodman. You guys say, as a teammate, I say Dennis Rodman. You guys say what? Worm. We say big man. Big man. Big man loved. Listen, Dennis. Did, Dennis didn't talk when he was a piston. Right. <laughs> right. He didn't talk. Mm-hmm. So, and it was like, and he just ran. And his bron- and his asthma was like a dragon. It, he he didn't talk. He did. And the coolest thing was, whatever it takes, Dennis would do with us. He has, you know, he's dis- you know, he, he's upset with a whole lot of things now. I watch him on television and I mm-hmm. hear him talk. Um, I don't I don't know any of the things he's talking about. Um, I don't want to get into him, but right, right. He, you know, he 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 is very upset with things that he... Sh- I don't feel he... Sh- well, he should be upset with whatever. Mm-hmm. But when it came down to playing, we didn't have all the stuff that you wind up seeing when he went to San Antonio. Yeah, Or yeah, when he yeah. got this guy. The big man wasn't like that. He was still going to Chuck's house for, for Christmas and still playing video games and, you know, driving Mark. cars. But that's not... That's not the Dennis Rodman we knew. Mm. I tell you what... Um, Sally, I think you probably know a lot of this. Is the fact that Dennis is from Dallas, yeah. and uh, I was in Dallas playing Dallas. We were moving up the ladder just like the Pistons were moving up the ladder, and um, our draft choice was getting ready to come up. And that's the year I thought we were getting Carl Malone, right, Smith? You yes. remember that, right? Yes, of course I do. But we didn't get him, right. or whatever <laughs> reason we did. Talk to somebody else about that shit. Um, you sound mad, Smith. <laughs> huh? 
I'm a little pissed off with that, Smith, because you know I thought I was supposed to win the title in, yeah. in, in Dallas, you know, mm-hmm. so I'm a little pissed off about that. So in our summer league, Mobile Summer League, you remember that, Smith? Of course, out in South Dallas. And there was this little kid in there who I think he worked at the uh, airport, didn't have a set of shoes, wore black socks, and I played against him in the summer league, and his name was Dennis Rock. No, nobody knew him at all. Nobody. Isaiah called up and said, Mark, we're thinking about <coughs> drafting this guy, Dennis Rock. And the first thing I said to him, yeah, take him. Just get his ass out of the Western Conference. Mm. I don't want to see him. <laughs> I don't want to see him. Dennis was so incredible, man. And the best thing about him, man, because of the way he grew up really – needing a lot of things. He was really in bad shape. Mm-hmm. But he was the most humble young man that I'd seen. Matter of fact, I took him to my house and let him stay there and play all his video games there. And he didn't even want to leave the house. Mm. I like, I got to go. Nah, I'm good right here. And what he added to our team, Smith, is that everybody, everybody on our team had some things to do. Dennis was the most humble basketball player I've ever met in my entire life. I mean, honestly, I tried to get him to go in some game. The hardest thing to do with Dennis was to tell him that he had to start. Yeah. I took him to Dennis Smith to say, Dennis, this is better for all of us. He say, Mark, but I don't, I say, Dennis, man, I mean, I'm trying to win another title and way we mix right now. The best thing for this team is for you to get in the starting lineup. I can handle this bench. I'll get my numbers off the bench. Mm-hmm. But we need that. Smith, it took two weeks to talk him into being in the starting lineup. And then he would get in games, and all of a sudden, he comes sit down and chuck the lineup a play, and he didn't think it was right for him. He said, well, you don't, do you want Mark in this game? Like, Dennis, stop, man. Chuck doing this. Stop. Yeah. Mm. You can't do that. Let Chuck do what he got to do. I'm over here when he need what I got. And he cried the first time. What was that? He won a defensive player. Defensive player of the year. Mm. Yo, man. And he, he cried, you say? He was crying. Right. He, oh. he had an ugly cry, too. He cried so <laughs> ugly. <laughs> oh, my God. You just want to give him whatever he wants. He, 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 speak the language, bro. Cried. <laughs> he struck and cried, Smith. Had to call him. He's still crying. Hey, man, leave but, it to sound to go talking some bullshit, man. I ain't never seen it. Do you ever you rest, man? <laughs> no, man, because this is the deal. When things are heavy, like, this is the craziest thing. When things are heavy, yeah. you... you uh, uh, huh, listen, you can ask Mark. You won't hear me joke. Right. When no. things are heavy, uh, you yeah. won't hear me joke. Yeah. No. When we win, yeah. or we about to win, yeah. That's when it comes. I take my mouthpiece out. <laughs> no. I, hey, want, I, love I want mouthpiece <laughs> just not to talk. Right. No, before, I love we move, before we move, Smith, I just want to say one thing about John Sally. Yes, sir. That he don't miss shit. Mm-hmm. He don't miss, look, he don't miss nothing. No. He gonna know when, where, how, and who fucked up. It's yeah. Sal, what happened what on the listen, we did go, you gotta do that. All right, pal. Uh, what happened, Sal? Well, you gotta move over here and do that. Hey, we can't do it like that. So, me being what I was on the floor, Lambeard talked, but he talked all that vicious stuff and all that. Was Sal, Lamb, was Lamb really that tough, Smith? Was Lamb really yeah, that but, tough? Sal, I need to know what's going on on the court. Mark, you can't let him go like that. Yeah. Then you got to do that. See, he talked to all of us. And when he was on the court, we had to listen. Now, when he got out the court, I ain't want to hear half of that shit Sal was talking about. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Sal is a comedian for real, though. <laughs> no, it's like, it's, like a deep, it's like a linebacker, right? Right. You, you may have... Uh, you have all these fast linebackers, but a linebacker that is knowing the quarterback's plays mm. and knowing knowing what his options are, right? Knowing, okay, if they run this guy back, it's just like football. If they're running this dude, this is a distraction, but if this is what they've done, remember, people are, are um, 
uh, creatures of habit. Yes. And if, and if you watch them play in a in a game and they get tight, they're going to go to the play that they know that they're going to keep doing that scores for them. All you got to do is know how to disrupt that play by seconds. Mm. Right? If, if all of a sudden we know it's a sideline uh, pick, as opposed to just letting the big man go to the sideline pick, make him go up four inches. Mm-hmm. Now, when that guy comes off the pick, he's not where he's been practicing to shoot. And if I stay close enough, stick my arm out, make him dribble one step out, the guard gets under me, I'm not letting the big man roll down. Right. So now that guard doesn't have a protector. And he's sitting there looking at the clock thinking, I got to take a shot. I got to do something spectacular. Well, as soon as you turn your back, all of a sudden you double team. You looking at it or you getting and you come into the lane thinking you go into the basket. Yeah. You're getting put on your back. Uh-huh. Once you get put on your back and your big man doesn't help. Or he looks at us like, man, you know, you shouldn't have gone in there. <laughs> Once you do that, uh-huh. you know, you know, you got their head. And when you get them arguing and talking between one another, it's cool. I would tell Mark, hey, you guard him. I guard him. Push him left. Oh, All you yeah. Do is push him left. When you push him left and he puts two hands on the ball, he's done. Mm. I heard all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, like, we went after MJ. Everybody talks about the Jordan rule. Go at him. He won't pass the ball. Right. He uh-huh. does not. I saw something on TikTok. They showed Michael Jordan passing the ball. There was only two passes. They you only say, show Michael. Say that again. Say that again, Sal. Say that again. It was two clips. It was two, two clips of Michael <laughs> passing the ball. That's it. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> and that's because he it probably slipped out of his hand. It wasn't because he wanted to pass the ball. No, he said slipped out of his hand. Listen, let, let's move to a different subject. I don't want yeah. people to think this beautiful young lady that we introduced earlier <laughs> is just here to be beautiful. She has some uh, some knowledge that she's going to share with us. Yes, so my name is Joy, and I'm currently earning my master's degree at the University of Maryland through their pharmacy department in cannabis science and therapeutics. And I am so excited to sit here with John because both John and his daughter have embarked on an amazing, amazing career in cannabis. And it's up to people like John and myself to get the message out about the plant, cannabis being a medicine, and how it impacts our health mm-hmm. and how it's beneficial. And so, John, tell us a little bit about wow. your endeavor. Okay, well, the, 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 uh, huh? I'm sorry, Joe. Sal, <laughs> yeah. me, Derek, and all the other laymans in the world, and Joy has educated me, but I really want to know is that there's a false narrative about cannabis, and there's... Yes not much, as I'm concerned, education about the real things that it's about, about healing people, about things that you can do to um, help chronic pain, the things, but you, you don't ever hear that. So I, I thought it would be great for you to understand because you're in the cannabis industry and she's in the industry of learning you know, more about it and how you do it. So, I mean, go from there and I'm going I'm to shut up and listen because I want to know. All right, so the first thing is uh, we appreciate you calling it cannabis. Most people would know it as marijuana, weed, pot, and it had, it had one of the strongest propagandas against it next to, I don't know, in the world. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was one of the strongest propagandas that this was, was to the point where I used to believe it. Mm-hmm. Now you, um, You're saying you believe the false narrative about I it. I used to believe the false yeah. Now, this is the craziest thing. Mm-hmm. Mark Aguirre fit perfectly on our squad <laughs> because there were um, important people on that squad who used cannabis for their pain. Mm-hmm. And they would keep it away from me. Like, I didn't, I didn't even know. Um, when I finally uh, partook in, in smoking cannabis, was 19, it was 2000. I was 36, mm-hmm. and it was um, uh, when I smoked it, I, I do yoga. All of a sudden, my shoulder wasn't hurt. Mm. My lower back wasn't hurt. I'm doing all kinds of stretches. I slept from, I think, 1 o'clock in the morning to 10, 15, and the bus was at 10, 30. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I jumped up. I did... Um, uh, 
it was one of the first times I didn't jump in the shower to the point where I grabbed all my stuff, got dressed in the elevator and made it to the bus and didn't have my jersey. But I had, you know, I had the sweat top on and I turned around to my teammate. I won't say his name. And I go, what was that? And he goes, I told you not to smoke it. That's the chronic. I said, y'all smoke this every night? And he goes, yeah. I, I would have played as long as Kareem. Now I know why Kareem and Chief smoke so much weed. Or so much cannabis. Uh -huh. <laughs> when I realized it, and I'm realizing I'm smoking this and I'm feeling better, I'm sleeping better. And then I started putting it in tea and drinking it. Mm. I started uh, um, I started all different ways of going about it in business. And, you know, I found out my daughter smoked. My wife, it was so funny. My wife caught my daughter at 16, <laughs> uh, seven, 16 smoking weed in the bathroom. And then she bought it in our room and she put it in the corner. Now, imagine smoking and being put in the corner. And I was laughing. <laughs> and she goes, this is not, this is torture. And I go, you smoked her weed. And she was like, that was her? <laughs> like, she, did, she didn't realize that, you know, we were doing what everybody trying to keep it away from my kids. And I remember when I said to my daughter, she said to me, um, she didn't want to play basketball anymore. I was fine. I got tired of going to those games anyway. <laughs> right. And um, I, I then said, uh, well, how about this? How about... And she said to me, how about this? You're going to invest in my college career. What I want to learn in college, they won't teach me at American University there in D.C., uh, Joy. She said, I want to be in the cannabis business. So literally two years ago, she was in the top 50 women in cannabis. Oh, wow. And, and I was, and she's the CEO. I'm the CVO. I'm the chief visionary officer, meaning um, I don't let, you know, I walk with a, like, like a, a bodyguard, as she know, knows so much about it. Mm. And she had chronic migraines and she had a concussion and she would smoke cannabis. When I then got involved and started paying more attention to what this cannabis was doing, I realized that cannabis, CBD part of cannabis and the THC part would be the answer to the opioid crisis. Yes. If you're taking opioids to alleviate pain, you should smoke cannabis. There's no, there's, there, there's no residue. There's no situation where you become addicted. People never become addicted to cannabis. They may want to smoke it all the time, but that doesn't mean they're addicted. Addicted meaning have to have it in order to work. Mm. I, I, I use it because it's better to use it while working. It opens up so many, so many um, things, receptors in my brain. It relaxes my body and takes away chronic pain and lets you have literally the enjoyment you need in order to live a, a fruitful life. So, I, so yeah, I got involved because of that. I'm going to ask you. Go, um, go ahead, Mark. That, that side, meaning that uh, John just explained it as um, a way to um, handle different issues in your life. And most people look at cannabis and saying, I just want to get high. But it does a lot more than that. And then there are Pacific type of cannabis that affects certain things, if I'm correct, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, John, I'm sure you would agree with this. You know, we first have to erase the stigma that's associated mm. with cannabis, and in particular in our community. But people have to understand the medicinal benefits of the plant. So whether you have chronic pain or um, inflammation, whether you want to stay focused for the day, so are you going to take a, a, a sativa versus an indica? Some people want to can enjoy the plant without having a psychoactive component, which is the Delta 9. So if you don't understand this and all you know is, yeah, I get my weed from Ray Ray on the street, he's not going to be able to possibly understand the medicinal benefits. So what the program and what we're trying to do as advocates is to educate people about the medicinal benefits so that they can understand that they don't have to take a pill that's going to ruin their that's liver. That's where I was going. They have, yeah. You know, they need to understand that if they eat an edible, how it's going to metabolize in the liver, and that's why you're going to feel something different, you know? Mm -hmm. So education is the key, but we yeah. have to get away from this reefer madness. You know, you're totally right. Cannabis was, you know, you could get find cannabis in pharmacies in the 1930s. It was medicine. It wasn't yeah. until it was scheduled as a Schedule One drug that all of us, you know, became federally legal. But it was legal at some point, and they knew the benefits of it. 
the big yes. pharma and other people that had interests, financial interests, like, wait, hold up. What you can take from this one plant, you have hemp and cannabis. So with hemp, sustainable housing, you could build things. Ford built cars with hemp, but it Close. impacted some other industries. So they were like, well, we're going to give, we're going to change the narrative. So that's why they did the whole hot reefer and tried to scare you. But now more and more people are realizing through integrative wellness and integrative medicine that it does help. It it's helps. Like, well, damn it. Let me, let me, my, 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 this is how you send it to me. Okay. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Sal, you know, I'm joking. <laughs> you know, I'm joking. But I, I, to my, what I want to say is that it's amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's amazing how lack of education scares everybody up when we know what the drugs that they gave us, fellas, when we were in the league, we know those things were chemicals that would eventually kill you, right? Will eventually ki burst your liver up, correct? Yeah, your liver and your kidneys. There's and your kidneys, situation. absolutely. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy named Dale, um, um, what's his name, Sean, used to play for uh, San Antonio and Alonzo Mourning. Yeah. They had, they had liver problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, had kidney I remember. problems. And I remember. I was taking six Advil a day thinking it was going to help my knee. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was literally taking them like uh, in well, one place. I ain't going to say the place, Detroit. <laughs> we had them in like a bowl and you would grab them and you take two Advil in the morning, yeah. two after practice. Then go to sleep, and then before the game, get an Advil and two Advil inside. Sal, and play that was league wide too, brother. That was yeah. league wide. That, yeah, and and it and it does not. It, it 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 was definitely not what it was supposed to do. It wasn't. It, it, this, we're in a pill popping society, and they oh, want man. you to pill. So you, they give you one medicine that you have to have another medicine that you have to have another medicine. So the the what they considered. I'm sorry, pills, uh, plant. Cannabis is a medicine. The rest of it literally goes into your body, metabolizes in your stomach, destroys your liver, gets in your bloodstream, and then tells the receptors that that doesn't hurt. So they never wanted to get to the cause of the problem. When they were talking about um, taking Advil because I had tendinitis, um, I said, I tell you what this tendinitis means. I mean, I have to literally take the information out of my body. But they didn't want to tell me that some of the foods I was eating yes. were causing the problem. <laughs> yes. And 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 some of the things I was was doing was causing the problem of inflammation. Like right now, I have an infrared, a far infrared uh, machine that lasts 20 minutes that literally does more than the rest. We used to sit in the sauna and soak after the game, not realizing really that's what we supposed what they should have done. Um, or I feel they should have done. They should have. Uh, when I got into watching Formula One, after a race, they break the entire car down. Mm -hmm. Then they put it back together at the next race. That's what they should have been doing. When we watched Rocky and we saw Drago and he was getting IVs, mm -hmm. and he was running on treadmills, and he was they were taking care of his body like it was a machine. He was a machine. This is the most amazing machine in the world. And in Genesis, God talked about all the fruits and seeds is your medicine. That's all of them. So they didn't want us to, they want you literally, I guess, four years. They want to patch you up as opposed to help fix. Heal, what, what heal you, opposed to healing you. Right. And, and, you know, it's illegal to say the word heal. Uh, Joy goes to a school. She's in the pharmacy school. And in the pharmacy school, they teach you to be a drug addict, a, a drug dealer. Oh. If you say, because that's what pharmacy does. When they, when they say, hey, I have this, and they go, well, take this pill. Because they were trained that this pill does this. As opposed to, let's figure out why you're having this problem. And when I got into cannabis, I started realizing, even down to the, to the, to the creams. I remember I, uh, one of our teammates' wife liked CBD, and I gave her some high-end CBD, and he said, Send me a case of that because it really works mm -hmm. to the point where Isaiah Thomas got into the CBD business when he started realizing not just because it could make money. Yeah. You, if, if, if you have a win-win, right, Joy, and I could make money and you can get better, 
it's it's bad for the pharmaceuticals when you don't have patients. Absolutely, absolutely. And what we fail to realize is that we possess an endocannabinoid system in our bodies. So yeah. we have neurotransmitters that respond to cannabis. Mm. Yeah. And nobody's ever died from an overdose of cannabis because you can't. Mm. So no. we have these neurotransmitters that are binding, the receptors are binding to the cannabis and that are naturally healing our bodies. Whereas if you have something yeah. synthetic, it has to create something. It has to metabolize. It has to treat one thing. And then, like John is saying, yeah, then you're going to have to treat something else. You're going to have to treat your liver yes, or your kidneys. Yes, yes, and yes. we have to do something different. We have Let's to. Add something. Just as a, this everyday guy. In that industry, can you get information on certain things that actually are affecting you now? Like, John, you were talking about I took this, took that, you know, see if it's inflammation or say it's some other thing. I mean, actually lead it to like uh, a specific uh, strain of cannabis that you found out that goes a certain place. Because understanding that different cannabis, different strains and different uh, uh, CDB oil, it affects certain things. So I don't know, but I wanted to ask that question so you can give me an example of Something that uh, in your industry that you can take that will actually affect, um, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, they affect certain parts of your body. If you, you need it, you know, you can go get that particular strain. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. I, and I, so the difference with me is I smoke Intica when I want to relax my entire body. It literally puts me to sleep. And being in the NBA, Dr. J used to tell me, you have to start taking naps in the day because you will become insomnic. You, it, it's just the nature of the game, the nervousness and what it takes to stay at this high level. When I started, when I smoked Indica and I was able to sleep, that means my body was resting. And when your body is resting, that's when it's healing. I smoke sativa because during the day, I have to deal with people. So I want my body relaxed. I want to feel good. Mm. But I want my brain open to have mm. the conversation. Like, I didn't smoke this morning. So probably I'm not making any sense to y'all. <laughs> but <laughs> if I were to smoke, if I were to literally adjust, it literally changes my thought process. And I say this. The NBA promoted, I'm sorry, sports promotes alcoholism. Uh-huh. And the reason I say that is on the backstop of every basket, yep. they used to say Budweiser. Yes, sir. At the football game, it says Bud Light. Yes. And so you give a savage, I'm sorry, a football player, <laughs> alcohol Ooh, after sad. losing the game <laughs> and expect this savage mm -hmm. to go back to being normal when you've already enhanced and destroyed his filter. Mm. So what does it lead to? Driving drunk, domestic violence. Yes, sir. Violence in the street. You have to go out to drink. The best thing about cannabis is after you play, you take a, a wonderful hit from a bomb, like because I like it in water, through water. It's a clean hit. You sit down, you relax. You don't feel like you feel like eating something and relaxing. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like beating up the girl or fighting the guy in the club Preach, to uh, something to you. Preach, baby. That's it. Yeah, that's not where you want to be. You want to literally realize that you should relax this body. You should get deep muscles massages. You should do yoga and, and mm. stretch. You should eat food that's alive, that helps your body. Remember, it, no matter what you do, if I give you a certain amount of plants, these plants are connected to you, right? You, you're made of carbon. These plants are carbon-based. They're literally put in to do certain things to help your body. Turmeric. Moringa, they lower your body temperature inside of your body. And lowering your body temperature along with cannabis, you literally won't gain weight. Mm. That, that, this, is, this is how you literally sustain, I'm sorry, by hiring your body temperature. And these things remove inflammation. So these plants that they literally try to get you not to pay attention to was because they were pushing the agenda of making money. There's a, there's a, I don't know if Mark remembers this, but I, 
I, yeah, he was. I don't know if he was on the squad then. In Miami, when I first started, yeah, he was. When I first started this, I got this thing called Yohimbe. Yohimbe is an African bark from this yeah, tree. Yeah, I know exactly what it is, yeah. That's for male enhancement, male Absolutely. stimulant. Yes. Instead, they literally banned it in America for 20 years while Viagra was put there. And the death, the death, oh, the, these, these are the side effects of, of Viagra. Death, <laughs> hearing loss, and sight loss. Mm -hmm. So you see Mark and you wearing glasses and you got your earphones on, you can't hear. So I... I, I <laughs> Sal, uh, <laughs> I got my glasses too. No, but Sal, you're I, taking I, me viral. I love it. You're taking I me did, viral. I realized, I realized that that if they stop, if, if the pharmaceuticals are so big that they have commercials, only in America are there pharmaceutical commercials. And in those commercials, they tell you while watching everything wonderful, all the side effects. And Great Britain won't allow that. UK won't allow that. Asia won't allow that. Like, we're not going to advertise. You're not going to make money because lying to these people. You know, people believe mostly everything they see or hear. Yeah. Especially if it gets on TV, they go, the government wouldn't let it happen if it wasn't real. And then they found this company extends was fake. Right. <laughs> so they, 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 not that they don't allow it in, is if you pay enough taxes, they turn their head. So now they cannabis is taxed way higher than pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Way higher. They, it, they are trying to make it still yeah, They're trying hard. to dilute it. They're trying to, trying to dilute trying to the make, progress yeah, of it. Yeah, trying to make yeah. you not enjoy not suffering. And well, that's me, what it is. It is. You guys give me an example of things that we don't see we, that infiltrates the minds of people all over America that pushes you away from seeking help by using CBD or cannabis. I mean, some just normal things that you'll hear, like, it's that, it's this, it's that, it's this. You know, and I know they're labeling or creating a narrative about that, but some of the ones that you will hear often that lead you to a, a, a the wrong idea or the wrong perception of what cannabis really is. You know, they have one-liners and tags and things like that. Can you guys, you and yeah. Sal? Joy, you start. Well, you have to understand that if you want the benefits of cannabis, you don't have to have the psychoactive. You don't have to have the Delta 9 component. So people associate, oh, I want to be high, or I don't want to be high. I might want to try it, you know, or even let's take a 80-year-old grandmother who has arthritis, and she may want to try it, but all she knows is that, oh, it's this gateway drug. I don't want to be high. There are so many types of routes of administration for cannabis where you don't have to have the Delta 9, the psychoactive. You can remove that and still have the benefits of an anti-inflammatory for her arthritis. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the key, again, is education. Mm -hmm. We have to let people know, and the stigma, you know, we have been taught that it is a bad thing. And like John was saying, Big Pharma is serious, and they know that it's its competitor. But the problem is, as long as it's a Schedule One drug, we can't do legally, the research is minimized. Because in order to do research on a medicine, you have to be able to show no harm. And as long as cannabis is considered a Schedule One, along with heroin and LSD, they're not, the government is like, whoa, well, we're going to possibly let you research, but you have to get your cannabis from the University of Mississippi, and it's not quality <laughs> cannabis, so you can't do these great studies. I mean, more and more people are suing to do studies, research, you know, uh, universities. So, yes, but where do we get our information? We have to go to Israel. We have to go to Germany, where they're free to do research because they're not scheduled. It's not scheduled. Mm -hmm. But because Big Pharma, you know, they're like, wait a minute. Mm. But they're not stupid either. So they're starting yeah. to gear. They're, they're, yeah. uh, they're going towards cannabis because they know there's an interest. And there's money. And the states are making a lot of money. Of course. So, yeah. you know, we're hoping that with Biden saying, oh, okay, I'm going to release the federal convictions but that's not where we are we're on the state level so we, we're hoping that's going to influence state laws yeah. for policy so, but you know john cannabis 
has to, it, it has, how do I say this? We need people to understand that it's medicinal. We don't care about the record. It's medicinal. Mm -hmm. And as a community, we have issues that can be prevented with the use of cannabis, Mm -hmm. whether it's high blood pressure, diabetes. And we have to be able to educate the consumer. Problem is, if you go to a dispensary, you may have a bud tender that may not even know. They may be like, oh, yeah, well, this has the highest content of THC. But that may not be what you need for a migraine. Mm-hmm. Right. You may need a hybrid. You may need a CBD and mm. a THC. But if we don't, educate, it's like a sommelier. If you go ask for a glass of wine and you don't have anybody that's knowledgeable, if you say, "Oh, I want something with this type of tannin," or yes. tell me about it. these kids or these employees are just there. They're like, "Oh, well, it works for me." Yeah. But that's not going to work for John or Mark or you, Derek. You know, it's like we have to educate. We have to create something. Mm-hmm where there's consistency. So, so there are people out there that are trying to say, well, this strain is specific to yes. this condition. Yeah, so we quick, know this for quick, a fact. Yeah. Well, hold on. That, Let me just hop before you start. Ahead, so sir. my mother, my mother, she, she passed. She was 96. And um, it got to a point where I, I brought her out here. She was 82 years old. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I put it in front of all what she called witch doctors. <laughs> she... Uh, she no longer needed a stent in her system. She was walking two miles a day. She Man. lost 20 pounds. And she thought it was amazing. When she was in the old folks' home, I bought her CBD in literally a banaca spray. Mm-hmm. My mom's was walk, was up in the, what's called, going to people, going, how you doing? Walking from room to room and trying to spray everybody in the mouth. My <laughs> son gave me, right? And, <laughs> and then my brother was like, you know, that's that's marijuana Johnny gave you in a liquid form. What? Johnny <laughs> put marijuana in my body? She said, well, I feel good. <laughs> and she said, and they feel good. Mission accomplished. If I, if I knew that this is what it does, I would have been doing this. So mm. imagine somebody who realized who had seven to eight different um, uh, medications that she would take throughout the day yeah. and throughout the month. And how she was like, oh, I got to go pick up my medicine. I was slowly but surely removing them. And I would say, hey, I got a tea for you. And she would drink the tea, put honey in it, feel good all day. Oh, wow. She would go, I'm going to bed. I go, hey, you want some tea? She goes, let me get, I give her some, some, a different tea. She'd sleep all day, wake up, stretching, feeling she was great. I had to literally show her, ma, if your body is constantly fighting, there's no way it can relax. And everything is about literally having a system in homostasis. That means in the best form you can possibly have it. Mm-hmm. So you guys, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Joy, I'm, I, I have a plant-based diet. I started my plant-based uh, journey in 1991. In 2007, when I became totally serious about it, I am now 239 pounds. I played at 250 pounds when I was a Laker. Mm-hmm. I regulated my weight less stress on my veins, on my arteries, I, I, on, my, on my limbs, I don't have arthritis. I don't have, um, uh, I, I'm, because of my seven foot and because I was born with a heart murmur and most seven footers or most athletes die from congestive heart failure. Yes, sir. When I went to the NBA, I said, we got to talk about congestive heart failure and them going to these different steakhouses and feeling that they're eating good food when it's not alive. Mm. I also talked about when you sit there every night and you go, oh, I drink socially, and not realizing that you're putting yourself in a position of becoming an alcoholic, Mm -hmm. which is aging you, destroying your liver and your kidneys, and your family. If, If a person were to ingest cannabis, and then come around everybody else to be the most pleasant person at Thanksgiving. You, 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 it's the best smoke in the world during Thanksgiving. If you're going to eat dead food, it's better to have that so you can be hungry and eat the things that your body likes. It won't even ask for the turkey. It won't even ask for the ham, believe it or not. So once your body starts realizing you're taking care of it, your body will take care of you. And when we talk about this cannabis, Mark was talking about, he asked the question, on some of the stigma. Stigma is that if you're a pothead, you're not successful. If you smoke weed, you're gonna you're gonna be a dummy. Mm-hmm. 
literally, if you smoke a sativa, in my case, doctor was right about hybrid, but when I smoke a sativa, my creativity is at the highest level mm -hmm. because I am opening up different receptors in my brain that allow me not just to base it on memory and ego, but ego seems to go out of the way and you become more, you become humble, you become uh, malleable, you could understand things, see things, as opposed to anger. Yes. Right? We know that anger is one letter uh, away from danger. There's no danger in smoking cannabis. So now, let me ask you all this. So we're, we're sitting here amongst each other, and we're, we're having this, this knockdown, drag-out conversation about the benefits of it. And you were talking about how do we push it out there, though? How do we get it out there? So what we're doing right now. There it is. The more positive conversation. Yeah. And, and, and this is the deal. I found out uh, in order to break a habit, right, in order to train somebody something, they have to see it 21 times before they give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Right? If they keep seeing that cannabis is, is good for you, cannabis does this. Some of the biggest sales of cannabis in California is in Palm Springs, which is the largest retirement community in <laughs> California. So they obviously realize it that as opposed to giving them things and sending them nurses, them smoking weed, walking, being in the sun mm -hmm. literally is healing. It is, and they would talk about plants, just plants in general. We'll, we'll, we'll move just away from cannabis. If you surround yourself with plants, you literally are healing your body. The plants let off healing just like water let off, lets off ions when you're by the ocean. It, it used to be when you went to a hospital and you did, they put you out by the ocean during the day, got you some sun, some vitamin D, ions on the body, you would start to heal. They started doing it for insane asylums when they started thinking, hey, let's put them closer to the water, and the water was helping heal. The same way with a plant. This plant being the mother. The mother plant is ayahuasca. We can get into that conversation one day. Um, <laughs> but, but Joy mentioned LSD. Remember, LSD was legal until Reagan decided that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And LSD literally opens up certain parts of your brain to the point here in California, it's no longer illegal. You can drop acid in California. You can be involved with different mushrooms. They, they are realizing things that are natural are mm. healing. Yes. But you know, we can talk about education and getting people on or to try cannabis, but it's also as an advocate, it's all about accessibility and affordability. Right. Come to my house. I'll give you a set of <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there in, I'll be there in January. So. <laughs> so once we educate people, we have to ensure that they can afford it. Yeah. And yeah, that they can get to it. Certain yeah, communities don't have dispensaries there. Certain communities don't have clinics that provide physicians that can recommend it. Right. 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 Man, I, I, certain I, cities, right. I wish we can could. I go. Can I tell one story about Mark Aguirre, though? Oh, before yeah. we go, Please Sal, do. I wanted you Please to tell do. that story, <laughs> Sal. <laughs> and I want to get your take, man, on Kyrie. Just you're, you're okay, the perfect well, I'm guy. Gonna get to that. I'm going to get to that. But let me tell you this one story. So, Mark Aguirre comes on the squad. And, you know, most basketball players fight with a referee in between them. Right. And talk while backing up. <laughs> well, Mark McGuire got into a fight with Bill and Beer, and Bill was backing up. And it was the first <laughs> guy that I saw that knew how to box. Yeah. And when I was on Best Day of Sports Show, they got the video of Mark about to be in a fight with Bill and how I moved out of the way right. and was laughing. <laughs> right. I thought that was something, man, because I always wanted somebody to be. Now, you already talked about those gloves, those <laughs> mittens that he has as hands, yeah. you know what I mean? He made a basketball and look like a thumb cord or something, you know? It sure did. <laughs> Do you know later on in my live in the hotel, they were playing golf. Mm -hmm. They were doing putt putt golf down the hallway where most guys would be at a strip joint or, or trying to entertain uh, somebody they shouldn't entertain. These guys were together. And I was thinking, he just was going to beat, beat his, beat his ass. skin <laughs> off him. And then I saw another teammate out with him. I won't say his name, Benny Johnson. And <laughs> I realized that those were the three weed smokers. Right. <laughs> you see how a world is ending? 
Oh my God. That is crazy. <laughs> Bill had the good weed. I heard Vinny had the best weed. <laughs> Bill had the money for it. And Mark showed him how to smoke it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Sal, you're going to take me viral. Sal, you're taking me viral, man. Like, <laughs> they were going to kill each other today. Right, right, right. Now they're playing putt putt golf. <laughs> In a Marriott, in a Marriott hallway. <laughs> that's, that's too good, sir. That is too Never good. Never forgot it. Right. Never so forgot it. Real, wow. real quick, j- just touch on what what you've seen from, from what happened to Kyrie. Okay, so first thing oh, I'm going to say about Kyrie Irving is 100% right. I think that, and this is why they went after Kyrie Irving. They went after Kyrie Irving because he didn't take the jab. Right. I told somebody he embarrassed a lot of people Mm -hmm. by being correct. The only person was Whitlock that came out and said, Kyrie should go go on a tour and said, I told you so. Jason Whitlock, right? Yeah, Jason, because CDC said exactly what Kyrie said. There's no reason I should take a vaccine if it's not proven to stop the virus. Right. He was 100% right. He never forgot that. When Kyrie said... You know, one day I was just looking, you know, I do a whole bunch of research and I saw my name, Kyrie, translates into Yahweh. And I wanted to see something. So I went on Amazon and they had a they had a, a documentary. Uh-huh. I thought it was interesting. So I posted. Didn't say a word. Still has not said a word. Except I now know who I am. That's what scared mm. everyone. When he, when, when all of a sudden, it's not about, look how much money I got how many cars I have. Yeah, I brother. bought this chain and this shirt cost $750. Preach when you got somebody making this kind of money that doesn't play into the destruction of themselves and talked about, hey, black people, we may be the lost tribe, one of the lost tribes yeah. that was shipped off here. When he mentioned that, you got the people who say, well, I don't want you to be one of ours. And if you start waking everybody up, then everything we put into controlling them and destroying them, you're going to stop. I, I realize this now that I'm 58. I didn't like Dolores Tucker either. Dolores Tucker, for those who don't know, was a lady who was speaking against gangster rap. She was black. Mm-hmm. And her biggest thing was, if we don't stop this gangster rap, we're going to destroy our community. We're going to start, they're going to start killing each other according to what they hear. They got rid of KRS. They got rid of X Clan. They got rid of anybody saying anything that didn't have anything to do with destroying the community. If and even I, I was watching, even Lior said, "Hey, it became between content and the community." And he said, "And I got people to feed. And if it's easier to get them to talk about destroying and putting a beat behind it." then that's what we're going to force them to buy. Kyrie didn't say anything of that. Kyrie didn't talk. Kyrie said, I'm not, you're not going to dehumanize me because right. I said I found something. He said nothing else besides. I watched every interview, right. every single one. Yeah. And the players, I'm only saying this, the players that didn't stand up with Kyrie are the same players that didn't stand up with Kaepernick. And when Kaepernick was right, everybody started wearing Black Lives Matter. Oh, man. But Kaepernick, that could have been prevented if we would have stood up and said, hey, enough. Yeah, man. That cop wouldn't have been, he would have been too fearful to do that. So Kyrie saying, hey, look into who we are. We're not just slaves. We weren't just brought over here as ignorance. We weren't allowed to learn to read. We weren't allowed to practice our religion. Kyrie said, I am a Jew. They didn't want him to be a Jew. Right. That's wow. all he said. My goodness. And then when we get to Kanye West, I'm sorry, when we get to Ye, Ye said, I'm jealous of the Jewish community. I'm jealous that they know how to stay together. I'm jealous that they uplift one another, that they go into business with each other. Yes. That they, that they don't abort their babies. I'm jealous of that. We need to emulate the Jewish community. Then he should have been quiet after that. <laughs> so <laughs> because should have, should have. when he was sitting around, he, like he even admitted, his mistake was saying Jewish. Yeah. Right? Because that was meaning all of them. Mm-hmm. And what he should have singled is, the, He singled them out. He, he should have singled them out. He should have said, 
either this guy who runs this media company and this guy, he shouldn't have mentioned their religion. Their religion right. encompassed all of them. Mm. And, and that shouldn't have been said. Mm. So, man, yes, I, I'm, I'm out of time. They're, they're probably not going to allow me to come back. But, man, when I tell you <laughs> that this... This was an education, man, that I think everybody needs to hear. So we're going to put it out there. And I'm going to have you guys back on again because you just echoed that we need to talk about it. And yeah. I, I would concur with that 100%, that we need to continue to, to push true narratives out here. And uh, tell Isaiah and Joe, we didn't want to talk about them. We wanted to talk about the real brothers, you and Mark. And <laughs> oh, no. Oh, <laughs> and Dennis no, no. And, no. I'm teasing, man. Those are my guys, yeah. too. Well, you guys can come on my show. I started the John Sally show. Yeah. And uh, I would have Joy on first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> smart, smart guy. Then, smart guy. <laughs> and then and then Hop and I are going to do an interview outside so he can breathe up all the air. Hey, Sal, that's what I was going to say. That's what, to look so funny, you're pretty damn smart, Sal. I'm not kidding. Yeah, you know what? It's so funny. I was, on, I was on Dr. Oz with Rick Mahorn. Yeah. I was talking health. And Rick looked at me and said, we couldn't find you for practice. I was, yeah, I was reading. <laughs> He said, man, you, you kind of smart. I go, yeah, that, <laughs> that was to be that killed. So I try to downplay it. I hear you, man, but this was great, man. Doc, you, you, is it, I, I can say doctor, right? No, no. 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 I'm <laughs> so she, sorry. She's getting her master's in. That's master, yeah. baby, thank you so much for your time. You're and welcome. we'll, uh, thank you for we'll, having we'll do it again sometimes, okay? Sal, I'm getting your number from Mark, man. Yeah, yeah, you can get it, definitely. Right. And Mark, I love you, man. Hey, love you too, man. Love man, I'll call you in I a always, minute. I, I always tell them. I always tell them because you never know, brother. You always tell people you love them when you love them. That's right, baby. Yes, That's right. Love Is that a day. bong? Oh, I thought one of my bongs. <laughs> no, no, it's not a bong. <laughs> I can't wait hey. to see you, brother. <laughs> we appreciate y'all, yeah. Joy, Sal, yes, man. A heart for to be your co-host. Um, I just enjoy the conversation, and um, I hope we can have quite a few more like this. All right, appreciate you, man. Oh, I'll call All you. Right. I'll call you sometime later, Smith. All Peace right, y'all. Love you. Talk. Talk Bye. to you. Bye.